The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Advent. We're so glad to have you worshiping with us from wherever you are. As you can see, the chancel is being transformed almost Sunday by Sunday in this Advent season. And today we have some beautiful poinsettias at the foot of the communion table. These are given and dedicated in memory and in honor of loved ones uh, from those in our congregation. And on Christmas Eve, just before we sing Silent Night, we will scroll the names of all of those who have been remembered and who are being honored. So thank you so much for supplying our beautiful Christmas flowers. And the flowers that you will see beside the podium are a special dedication this morning and gift of Charles Curitan in memory of his beloved wife, Mary Curitan. And we thank Charles for that. As we come more deeply into this season and head on towards Christmas, for us in the Presbyterian Church USA and for so many other denominations around the world, it's an opportunity to join in the Christmas joy offering. We're going to be receiving that offering a beginning next Sunday. That will be the 20th of December. I say beginning because in this time of distance, uh, not being able to be together, we'll extend that offering uh, for the weeks following Fourth Advent as well. But to give us an introduction to that offering and to encourage us to give generously, uh, let us hear now from an elder of our church, Mark Gooch. And then let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. I want to speak for a few moments about the Christmas joy offering. I want to start with a poem that I came across of all places in a sympathy card, but I've come to really appreciate it. It's written by Roy Lesson and it's titled The Impact of One Life. You may have heard it before. When a stone is dropped into a lake, it quickly disappears from sight, but its impact leaves behind a series of ripples that broaden and reach across the water. In the same way, the impact of one life lived for Christ leaves behind an influence for good that touches the lives of many others. 2015 was supposed to be a big year for Rose Bryant, with positive changes for her and her son, and it was. But things did not go exactly as expected. A new work opportunity was supposed to open up so many doors for me, Rose says, until it was discovered that she'd never finished college and earned the degree required for the new job. This forced her to understand that not finishing school was holding her back. Rose resigned from her retail job to become a teacher, a journey which started with returning to Stillman College where she had previously attended to retrieve her old transcript. It was like divine intervention, Rose explains. When I went by the school to pick up my transcript, one of my professors recognized me and asked if I was coming back. He wrote something on a slip of paper, folded it up, and asked me to take it to admissions. That note pointed to a grant that Bryant could qualify for that would cover two sum summer classes to get her started. She got A's in both, which boosted her confidence to believe that she could earn her degree. But she still had doubts about having enough money to continue on. But then another pair of wonderful things happened. The first, another chance meeting, and the second, a scholarship. Rose ran into her high school choir teacher, Mrs. Jocelyn Richardson, now leading the renowned Stillman College Choir, who asked her to join. As I started my second semester, I was unsure how I could pay for it, but then I got a choir scholarship. Everything again just fell into place. This is where I was meant to be. In 2019, Rose graduated with her degree in education. 
She now works as a seventh grade English and language arts teacher for the Dallas Independent School District. The Christmas Joy Offering supports Presbyterian-related schools and colleges like Stillman. Rose encourages us to support the offering because it can make such a big difference. I don't think I would be here without the support of Stillman, she says. The amazing thing is that all of this has had a ripple effect. I was able to finish my goal because of the support I received, and I know of at least six people who came directly to me about how they could do the same, including my younger sister. The ripple effect that Rose speaks of starts when each of us does some small thing, such as giving a gift to the Christmas joy offering, the power of which grows stronger and stronger as it is passed along. Please give generously. When we all do a little, it can add up to a lot. You can contribute by sending a check designated for the Christmas joy offering to the church office. Thank you. Good morning. For this third Sunday of Advent, we have carols and tunes from around the world, including Spain, Finland, and England. For the prelude today, a Spanish carol, En el Frio Interval, with the uh, English text, Cold December Flies Away at the Red Rose Splendor, April's Crowning Glory Breaks While the Whole World Wonders. Referring to the whole of Christ's life and not just his birth, of course. That particular arrangement is by American composer and organist Charles Callahan. The anthem today by our choral scholars is a haunting tune uh, from the Finns, a Finnish folk song, Lost in the Night, set by American Kyle Hagen, who's uh, an organist, tenor, and composer in the Pacific Northeast. Finally, the postlude on the hymn tune Truro from Cornwall in England, uh, setting of Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates. This particular arrangement was done by Wilbur Held, who for 30 years served as a professor of organ at Ohio State University. He also served Trinity Episcopal Church on Capitol Square, and he died just in 2015 at the ripe age of 100. Thank you.
I dream of dance parties in the kitchen. I dream of laughter that is contagious. I dream of birthday candles and another beautiful year. I dream of family game nights and dinner parties with friends. I dream of homemade Halloween costumes and homemade family recipes. I dream of pillow forts, fireflies, and front, front porch swings. I dream of every little thing that brings joy, and I know it comes from God. So today we light the candle of joy as a reminder that God's dream for this world involves the end of all tears. God's dream for this world involves a joy that overflows and is contagious. So may this fire burn bright, and as it does, may we sing. May we dance, may we laugh, may we hold on to the people we love. May we, may we sow joy in a hurting world, and may we be an act of holy resistance. Amen. Please pray with us the prayer of confession. O oh, great writer, with a sky full of stars and a world full of flowers, there should be no end to my joy. And yet, instead of decorating my very being with joy, I let it slip away like loose change. Instead of singing like Mary or dancing like David, I pass by remarkable beauty and love, most days unfazed. Forgive me. Teach me the ways of children who laugh and dance and sing, as if joy is the very thing that keeps them alive. Maybe they have joy figured out. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. Please turn to others around you and offer a gesture of peace. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Shepherds, Jesus is born. You will find him lying in a manger. 
wise men followed a star to the stable of baby Jesus. They brought presents because they loved him. We give gifts at Christmas to show our love. Happy birthday, Dita! The scripture tells us that you are our water when we are thirsty, that you are our bread when we hunger. Today, as we come together, yet far apart from one another to worship, we are overwhelmed with the many problems of our hearts, of our families, of our community, and of our world. We look inward to ourselves and our own intellect and experience, but we do not find what we need. We look to each other where we find compassion and understanding, but we do not find what we need. And we turn to many outside choices we have in our lives, but again, we do not find what we need. We are afraid in this time, as we have never been afraid. And in this time, we turn to you, O oh God. The prophet Isaiah gives us the answer. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. My word will not return to me empty, but it will achieve what I desire. As we pray for the poor, those who are nations away from us, and those who are near, we pray for a new direction for those who are charged with helping them and for our own hearts and actions. As we pray for the sick, those we know and hold dear to us, and those we will never know. We pray for new direction for those in power who make critical decisions about health care, for those doctors and nurses who provide health care, and for our own ways that we may provide comfort. As we pray for our church, our community, our country, and our world, we pray for change in so many ways. We seek comfort from your words to the prophet Moses. The Lord God goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave or forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Help us to follow your way in this Advent season. We will struggle as we wait for the birth of Jesus. And as we do, we are strengthened as we hear his comforting words. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We join now in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue our journey together more deeply into the season of Advent, we return again this week uh, to the Old Testament lesson the book of, from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61. In this chapter, in this part of the book of Isaiah, third Isaiah, the writer proclaims the year of the Lord. And the year of the Lord is another way of talking about the Lord's jubilee year. That is a concept that is found first in Leviticus chapter 25 and repeated in Deuteronomy 15. It's the release of debts, the release of captives, the return of the land to those who became landless. It's a time of justice and joy. So let us hear now, beginning with the first verse of Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, 
the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an ever everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, as the bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. As we continue our journey more deeply into this season of Advent, I am realizing that this time and the Christmas season itself are fashioned around stories. There is no knowing what really happened around the birth of Jesus, but our imaginations are taken with the stories that we have heard from our childhood, stories that originate in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. We are not claiming to know the mind of God, but we have heard some stories that inspire us, that cause us to question our motives in life, that have led us to be more loving and generous, stories that have inspired us to strive toward our better humanity. And just such a story, an epic poem, really, is found in the books of Isaiah. Israel, the people of God, had, according to the story, forsaken the ways of God's justice and loving kindness and had been overthrown. Jerusalem was destroyed. The great temple was left in ruins and the cream of its populace led off into exile in Babylon. The first part of Isaiah chronicles the failures and destruction of Israel. Then second Isaiah, beginning in chapter 40, speaks words of forgiveness and reconciliation. Finally, third Isaiah, beginning with chapter 55, breaks out in ecstatic bursts of joyous poetry, proclaiming the restoration, no, the complete transformation of a defeated and exiled people. What an astounding message that must have been to a people acquainted with the sorrow and grief of exile and domination and servitude. This joyful vision of salvation articulated in the words of Isaiah could be a vision for us as well. Suffering as we are under global pandemic, national political estrangement, personal economic peril, suffering not in some otherworldly dimension, but in the lives of those around us and in the lives 
that we ourselves are given to live. If good news to the oppressed, binding up the brokenhearted, liberty for the captives, release for the prisoners, proclamation of the year of the Lord's favor, comfort to all who mourn, these biblical markers of the Jubilee year, if they have any hope of succeeding in transforming the world, then this is a message of challenge and invitation to us. In concert with the divine spirit, we are the ones who are tasked with making this vision of God's jubilee happen. This promise of hope for the future requires a commitment of our time, our personal gifts and talents, and our personal financial resources as we consider our pledges to the ministry and mission of our church in the year 2021. But more importantly, it invites the engagement of our imagination and our whole person. These verses from the prophet poet of Isaiah 61 inspire us to take heart, to enact hope each and every day of our lives. Who knows what joy may come or in how many ways hope may be reborn. Now, far removed from the setting of Isaiah, yet echoing its joy and hope, another wonderful storyteller and observer of life, Robert Fulgham, tells this Advent tale, a story that captures the spirit of this time. He begins, A Sunday afternoon it was, some days before Christmas, with rain, with wind, with cold, winter's gloom. Things to-do list was long and growing like an unresistant mold. Temper, short. Bioindex, negative. Horoscope reading suggested caution. And the Sunday paper suggested dollars, death, and destruction as the day's litany. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy, fa la 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 la. This holy hour of Lord's Day bliss was jarred by the pounding at the door. Now what? Deep sigh. Opening it, resigned to accept whatever bad news lies in wait. I am nonplussed. A rather small person in a cheap Santa Claus mask carrying a large brown paper bag out thrust. Trick or treat! Santa mask shouts. What? Trick or treat! Santa mask hoots again. Tongue tied, I stare at this apparition. He shakes the bag at me. And dumbly, I fish out my wallet and find a dollar to drop into the bag. The mask lifts, and it is a kid with a $10 grin taking up most of his face. Want to hear some caroling, he asks in sing-song English. I know him now. He belongs to a family settled into the neighborhood by the Quakers last year. Boat people, Vietnamese, I believe, refugees. He stopped by at Halloween with his sisters and brothers, and I filled their bags. Hong Duk is his name. He's maybe eight. At Halloween, he looked like a wise man with a bathrobe on and a dish towel around his head. Want to hear some caroling? I nod, envisioning an octet of urchin refugees hiding in the bushes, ready to join their leader in uplifted song. 
Sure. Where's the choir? I'm it, he says. And he launched forth with an up-tempo chorus of jingle bells at full lung power. This was followed by an equally enthusiastic rendering of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And finally, a soft-voiced, reverential singing of Silent Night. Head back, eyes closed, from the bottom of his heart, he poured out the last strains of Sleep in heavenly peace into the gathering night. Wet-eyed, dumbstruck by his performance, I pulled a $5 bill out of my wallet and dropped it into the paper bag. In return, he produced half a candy cane from his pocket and passed it solemnly to me. Flashing the $10 grin, he turned and ran from the porch, shouted, God bless you, and trick or treat, and was gone. Who was that masked kid? Hong Duk, the one-man choir delivering Christmas door to door. I confess that I'm usually a bit confused about Christmas. It never has made a lot of sense to me. It's unreal. Ever since I got the word about Santa Claus, I've been a closet cynic at heart, singing about things I've never seen or done or wanted, dreaming of a white Christmas I've never known. Christmas isn't very real. And yet, and yet, I'm too old to believe in it and too young to give up on it, too cynical to get into it and too needy to stay out of it. Trick or treat. After I shut the door came near hysteria, laughter and tears and that funny feeling you get when you know that once again Christmas has come to you. Right down the chimney of my midwinter hovel comes Saint Hong Duk. He is confused a little about the details, like me, but he is very clear about the spirit of the season. It's an excuse to let go and celebrate, to throw yourself into holiday with all you have wherever you are. I'm it, he says. Where's Christmas? I ask myself. I'm it, comes the echo. I'm it. Head back, eyes closed, voice raised, in whatever song I can muster the courage to sing. God, it is said, once sent a child upon a starry night that the world might know hope and joy. I'm not sure that I quite believe that, or that I believe in all the baggage heaped upon that story during 2,000 years, but I am sure that I believe in Hong Duk, the one-man Christmas choir shouting trick or treat door to door, I don't know who or what sent him, but I know I am tricked through the whimsical mischief of fate into joining the choir that sings of joy and hope. Through a child, I have been treated to Christmas. The stories are ancient, and the stories are new, because we are here to hear them, to make them our own. On this third Advent, the Sunday we call Joy Gaudete, 
in the dark throes of deepening winter and pandemic, and the desperate news of a world spiraling in so many terrible directions of hurt and pain and fear, the question is this. Can we be surprised by some glimmer of hope, some echo of joyful anticipation? This is our struggle. This is our challenge as we try to keep faith in these uncertain times. The inspiration spoken by ancient Isaiah, believe it or not, is that the hope of the world rests not on some cosmic divine intervention. The hope of the world rests in the work that we, divinely created images, are called and inspired to do. We are called to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor? Will our legacy be peace on earth, goodwill to children, women, and men, goodwill to all humanity and nature itself? Or will we be distracted by insecure self-centeredness. Like it or not, we are it. We embody the jubilee of Isaiah. Will we be good news to the oppressed? Will we bind up the brokenhearted? Have we the courage to proclaim release to the captives, release to the prisoners. Can we imagine what a jubilee year might entail with the release of debts and the return of property? As we consider the Isaiah story in our own time, let us not forget Isaiah's challenge. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Against all odds, and in the face of untold suffering and uncertainty, may we somehow give garlands and not ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. May it be said of us that like in a garden, righteousness, right actions are springing up among us before all nations. Amen.
Now we hear the heavens whisper as the veil is growing thin. Could it be that faithful whispering, faithful maintaining, faithful action, faithful prayer is beginning to wake the earth, is beginning to break the bonds that hold us, the bonds of violence and oppression, the bonds of raging disease, the bonds of loneliness and disregard. Could it be that in this season we might hear the heavens whisper? Because as we heard in our story today, we are it. I'm it. You're it. Let that be our hope and our promise this Advent. As you leave the sanctuary this day, go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever, that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always, that together we are being empowered for faithful witness and loving service this day and every day. And may God's hope peace, joy, and love abide with you. Amen.